Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at FlexLogix with Chan Wang, who's going to talk today about how to improve density and time to market with embedded FPGAs. Chan, one of the advantages of a custom design ASIC is that you get high density, and but you have you're very rigid in terms of what you can do with that. There's a lot of protocols and developments that are coming into markets that you don't know, and you don't have that kind of programmability. So you basically have to build a new chip every time you want something new. With an EFPGA, you have the flexibility, but you don't necessarily have the density and or necessarily the time to market. How do you get there? Yeah. So with embedded FPGAs, um, density is very important and performance is very important and that's why traditionally FPGAs are built as a full custom uh, fabric. They start from the switches, they start from the logic and then they build layer by layer and, until they have a, a chip that is basically handcrafted with you know the place and realm software there to help but the guts of the the chip is done as a full custom design. And that is generally what people have been using to get the best performance, the best density possible. But with embedded FPGAs, like you said, Ed, there is a variety of market we have to serve. The process is constantly changing, and the process is also um, expanding in terms of the number of flavors and variants you're offering. And therefore, it is crucial, especially for an emerging market like embedded FPGAs, to be able to port quickly and cost-effectively. And this is one of our fundamental advantages that we have been tackling, which is to get density and performance from an architectural perspective and not from brute force custom design in the physical design space. So really what you're going for is mass customization, right? Yes, what we want to go for is to be able to customize very quickly um, for a variety of different process nodes and capacities without having to go and rebuild a full custom design for every end customer or every flavor of the process node that we're targeting. So what have you drawn out to get there? Yeah, so uh, like I said previously, we start now from the architectural level. So instead of tr uh, trying to start from a traditional FPGA architecture and brute force custom design to get to the best power and performance possible, we actually step back on the custom design effort, yes, we pay some price in terms of performance and area by, by doing mostly standard cell designs, but we have a fundamentally superior FPGA interconnect fabric which will compensate for that overhead and the end result is an extremely competitive embedded FPGA that is on par with the best in terms of density, performance, but where orders of magnitude lower in terms of porting time and porting cost. How does this compare with a traditional FPGA, a discrete one? Most FPGA experts know that the interconnect, the routing fabric of the FPGA, especially in modern days, is easily 80% of the overall area of the FPGA. It is a single most component in terms of power consumption and area. Um, and traditionally, FPGAs have been built on a mesh interconnect architecture. Um, it started in the mid-80s. Um, with 64 and 128 lookup tables, um, where lookup table and flip-flop is the fundamental logic component of the FPGA. Um, this is what constitutes a quote-unquote gate array. However, as I've previously mentioned, now this is a small portion of the overall area of the FPGA, while the routing fabric that connect all these LUTs and flip-flops together is you know, the vast majority, 75-80% uh, of the overall um, FPJ core area that we're looking at. So um, a mesh architecture is actually fairly straightforward. You have a number of tracks running horizontally, and you have a, a number of tracks running vertically, and the lookup table will take its input by tapping into these tracks, programmable at a number of these locations, and its output is sent back onto the interconnect network at a number of uh, locations that is programmable to be on or off. So. The, the output of this LUT flop can be programmed to send its output, for example, to this track. And this track can then traverse up the column or down the column and choose to go up continuously or to go to any one of these horizontal tracks. Now, modern day FPGAs have done a lot of depopulation. Depopulation meaning reducing the number of these switches in order to get to a, a slightly lower area. However, the fundamental 
scaling of a mesh interconnect network is O to the n squared, uh, which means for n number of lot flip-flop combinations, you're going to need, in the worst case, n squared number of switches in order to fully route any uh, lot flip-flop's output signal to the input of any other lot flip-flop. What was the genesis behind this? What, what prompted you to come up with this kind of architecture? Well, yeah. So I was looking into FPGAs, uh, harking back a decade ago into my, my uh, PhD days at UCLA. Um, back then, we were building a lot of full custom ASIC, and we're looking into the next step of custom ASIC in terms of just seeing the skyrocketing cost in expanding ASICs, uh, in developing ASICs. So we say, you know, it's time to make ASICs more programmable. But programmable logic are expensive, they're large, and they're slow. So we started looking to can we make just a better programmable logic. We weren't targeting embedded FPGAs. We're just trying to make FPGAs smaller. And this is what, in the end, uh, resulted us to develop a more hierarchical architecture. So how does that compare to a hierarchical architecture? Yeah, sure. So a hierarchical architecture and a mesh architecture is complete, is fundamentally different in the way the interconnect is routed. Of course, being an FPGA, the left flip-flop portion of the FPGA remains. However, we now have what looks like, in terms of network topology, a butterfly factory, which is basically a folded version of a banished network. A banished network has been used from for telecommunications starting in the 60s, um, and it's still co uh, commonly used in telephony. And a folded banished network, or a butterfly factory, is actually quite commonly used in high-performance computing as well. Um, however, it is not commonly applied at the chip level. It has mostly been used you know, in systems. Um, however, what we have here is a hierarchical network that is developed for, to, for FPGA chips. And we can see that the LUT flip-flop um, outputs will go into the stage zero of the interconnect switch, which can then choose to go um, to stage one at the same location or stage one at the next location. Um, in this case, the branch distance is one. And it can then continue to go to stage two um, at the same location or at a different location with a branch distance of two. And at any point it have reached its desired uh, uh, location, it can choose to U-turn back down the hierarchical network, down to a LUT flip-flop, or down to a switch and then branch to a different LUT flip-flop. So basically a butterfly battery can, um, can have the signal go up to the required stage in order to reach its destination and then tra uh, traverse back down the hierarchy. So really what you've done is add weights into a matrix, right, in terms of what you're trying to get to on a final result. If you look into the fundamental element of a switch in here, it's actually, uh, you're right, a two input, two output switch matrix. Um, but instead of building the entire switch as a brute force uh, sw a switch matrix in a mesh network, we now have hierarchicalized the switches into many smaller uh, switches at different stages of the interconnect network. Um, the fundamental difference here is where here you, uh, you only O to the n squared number of switches in a hierarchical network. It is well known to only require O to the n log n number of switches. How hard is this for n customers to master and understand? Uh, most customers frankly do not care, but those who are expert in the art will appreciate the amount of effort that went into here. But for every end customer um, who is agnostic to what happens in here, what they will have is an FPJ or an embedded FPJ that is scalable to a large capacity of LUTs, hundreds of thousands of lookup tables and millions of lookup tables, and have a substantial reduction in area, in power, and with you know very comparable performance to what you will have here in a mesh network. And so really what you're creating is a black box, but you're taking us under the surface to show why this is so effective. Absolutely, because uh, most customers will be baffled at why we can have a standard cell-based design um, that comes extremely uh, close to a full custom FPGA in today's uh, state-of-the-art uh, suppliers. And 
this fundamental underlying technology is what enables us. And we have, a, and this is just a summary of what we have done um, in our patent filings. We have a number of patents uh, protecting this technology, and you can look at our website for details. Chen Wang, thanks for a great explanation of what's going on inside an embedded FPGA. Uh, thank you very much.